Good afternoon. How's everybody doing? Thank you so much for coming. It's intimidating to follow all these wonderful speakers. I'm going to try to move past my fears. <laughs> I've written this book, and the end to the book, the epilogue to the book, is a letter to my sons. And it just so happens that that letter to my sons, who are here in the audience, um, fits very well with the theme of this conference, The Road Less Traveled. And I have not yet read it aloud to them because there's some very painful stuff in it. And I, I decided I would use this opportunity to do something a little bit different, The Road Less Traveled, a little bit different than the normal TED Talk. I'm going to read the letter, paraphrase the letter to them. Um, part of what makes it a little bit painful is it contains some lessons that a lot of African American families feel the need to impart to their black boys in private. But again, what I have to say to them fits with this idea of the road less traveled. So I'm going to do this in front of a couple of hundred people. I may fall flat on my face, <laughs> but I'm going to give it a try. So let's, let's see. Dear Logan and Langston, are they gorgeous? The best thing that ever happened to me, followed by being married to that guy. It's a miracle uh, that I was able to form this family. Dear Logan and Langston, I have written a book that undermines the possibility that you may ever benefit from affirmative action or legacy preferences. And I'm writing this, but, but other children besides you uh, will have not had the opportunities that you had. And I wrote that book, this book, Place Not Race, for this reason. Um, in this letter, I want to arm you with insights about how to be successful and how to contribute to society. Every road eventually bends and presents risk, presents challenge. And I encourage you to face those challenges. Life will not always be fair to you. To face those challenges with the wonder of an explorer and just persevere, as your beautiful Grandma Harriet, who's in this audience, says. She's taking a picture of herself. Isn't she gorgeous? 89 years old, gorgeous. She always says this, persevere, persevere. Well, while you're persevering and doing all the things that are expected of you, homework, reading, going to the Mandarin tutor, which we did this morning, piano lessons, tennis lessons, what, you, you name it, um, carve out time for the things that you're truly passionate about. And what do I mean by passion? Your passion is the thing that you wake up thinking about. Go to bed sleeping, dreaming about. The thing that you want to do even when it frustrates you, even when you have doubt about whether you'll ever be good at it. Your passion is what you want to do all day every day if you could. It's the secret to life. Now listen to me, I'm telling you the secret to life. If you can figure out what you would do for free and carve out time daily to do it, maybe one day you'll be fortunate enough to be paid to do that. But even if you're not paid to do it, Still, carve out time daily to do it, if only because it feeds your soul and gives meaning to your life. But while you're pursuing your passion, recognize that some things aren't going to be the things you, you're going to have to do some things that you're not passionate about. And just deal with it. Accept it. Work and work. 
and work some more. And if you're struggling with something that you don't understand, find somebody who can explain it to you and go back to work. That is what Cashins do, I was told. This is the earliest picture I, I have of my, from my family, my great-grandfather and his first grandson. That picture was taken in the 20s. Uh, in Decatur, Alabama, in the you know, height of virulent, nasty, violence-backed Jim Crow. But this family and many other families through hard work, African Americans, it's what African American families had done from the beginning. They toiled in the face of adversity and they prospered. Look how beautiful they are, right? They prospered. That is what Cashins do. That is what Clarks do, who are here. That is what Chambliss's do. That is what our people have done from the beginning. Your grandfather did it. My father, Dr. John Logan Cashin, Jr. And I hope you will remember him. And not just as the man in the wheelchair we would visit in the nursing home before he, his voice was reduced by dementia to a whisper. He strode proudly in the world and talked about what he would do. Now here, he's running for governor against George Wallace in 1970 in Alabama. Talk about the road less traveled, right? He was an agitator. Um, but more relevant for this talk, uh, he also was a two-time valedictorian who demystified academics for me. He would talk about how he would get up at 4 and 5 in the morning to do mind work when nobody else was around, even though he had a reputation as a partier, and he was, but he always did his work first, right? Now, he got kicked out of Fisk University, expelled for having a co-ed party in his dorm room when he was a freshman, but he, he recovered from that mistake, and he went on to be valedictorian of his medical class at Meharry University. And he learned his, the habits of success from his mother, my beautiful grandmother, Grace Brandon Cashin, who was a high school principal. And she took no crap from her sons. That's why I don't let you take, you know, give me crap, right? That's why <laughs> mommy is hard on you sometimes, right? Grace Brandon Cashin, raised both of her sons to be valedictorians. I'm a third generation valedictorian. That's my father there and my uncle Herschel. Um, I, learned, I, you know, I, I learned the habits of success from my father. Um, and I remember when I was at Vanderbilt, my alma mater, my freshman year, the first time, my finals, you know, first finals period I experienced. I remember being at the Heard Library, which is the main library at Vanderbilt. I must have logged a dozen hours that Saturday. I'd never, never studied that long in one day. From the beginning, early in the morning to late at night. And I didn't think I had that in me. But each hour that passed, I found new wells of strength. And it never occurred to me not to work that hard. Always, I was told to reach, to, 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 to try to get an A. It wasn't about the grade so much, but it was the reaching. And, and that is what I did. I reached, reached, stretched myself, and graduated summa from Vanderbilt with a degree in electrical engineering. And I do that, say that, like others who've gone before me, I say that not to be self-congratulatory, but to, to say, you know, for a kid who had um, an SAT score of 1150 on the first try, no one would have predicted I'd graduate summa in electrical engineering. Push yourself. Work. You saw your father do it last year. My husband already had, your dad already had two degrees, a law degree and an undergraduate degree, and he went back to school, even though he had um, a full-time job, went back to school just to pursue something that interested him. China policy studies from SICE, even doing this with a full-time job. He worked for, you saw him toiling for hours 
at the computer. And always, I'm, I'm bragging on him, he's embarrassed, but always he got an A. And it's, again, it's not the great, it's the striving. It's the, it's the exerting of yourself. Everything worth doing is hard, difficult, complicated. If you are not pushing yourself to do something, pushing yourself past your, your comfort zone and trying hard um, at something really difficult, you're not honoring your legacy and you're not, you know, uh, realizing your full potential. Now, it's become trite of late to talk about failure. You should welcome failure, but it's true. Um, I failed repeatedly in trying to get, find a publisher for this book. And it was, you know, my first two books came really easy. Publisher, getting a publisher came really easy. I'm not used to failing. It was kind of humiliating and humbling. Repeatedly I failed. But what did I do? With every rejection, I'd go back to my ideas, I just wouldn't give up on it. And, and once I set aside my ego and just, focused on the work, the process became joyful. And I decided to persist and have the courage of my convictions. And here's the road less traveled point. I wrote this book that I come from the civil rights community. I clerked for Thurgood Marshall. Um, and yet, I, I wrote a book, Place Not Race, saying affirmative action should be available to people like Senor Gonzalez who come from um, disadvantaged backgrounds and low opportunity schools, high achieving kids from low upper school schools, regardless of skin color. Um, I wrote that knowing that people in the civil rights community might not be too happy with that argument, but I really truly believed that it was consistent, powerfully consistent with my civil rights legacy and with the values of civil rights, the idea of universal human dignity and this notion of coalition building, gathering power among um, a, a lot of people who are mutually locked out of selective institutions. So where does that leave you, my dear sons? Being a black male in America is wonderful and perilous. You don't have the luxury of being casual about your life. I'm not looking at him. One of my sons is mortified, like, why are you doing this to me? Why are you doing this to me? <laughs> but you don't have the luxury of being casual about your life, where it can be ruined in an instant. At a party where young people under 21 are drinking alcohol, y'all have never done that or smoking marijuana, you don't know what that is yet, but you will. If the police are called, you, the black boys, may be the only ones who are hauled off to jail. And that's a true story that was shared with me, to me, with, with me with, by a friend. Um, I do worry that I can't protect you from predatory policing or the fact that the United States of this society will never love you the way I love you. One day, you will cease being adorable in the eyes of other people. And all I can do is prepare you for that. Um, before your face, first facial hairs emerge, you will notice that some people are afraid of you. They may lack the empathy that you already possess. Every day when we go to school, we pass the same two homeless women every day. And you ask about that person. You look at them. You don't look at the other way. You ask about that person, how she got there, how she survives, what she eats. You Sometimes you talk about giving them some money, and I encourage you in that. That's another legacy of your family. Caring and giving about, caring about other people, giving to other people. I skipped over something, I'm coming back to the, the, the predatory point. This is an old story in America, this idea of predation and, and uh, 
profiling of black folks. Your great-grandfather, your great-great-grandfather, Herschel Vivian Cashin, was violently ejected from a train in 1890, even though this patrician lawyer, you know, he's a patrician lawyer, just because he sat where he wanted to. Your father, your grandfather, who I talked about, was violently clubbed over the head by a state trooper. Um, knocked unconscious because he got out of his fancy convertible, talking too confidently to the police in his estimation. Your mother, me, was stopped for speeding. I was speeding, I, I was speeding, but stopped in Avondale Estates for speeding. The policeman made me get out of the car, stand spread eagle, and he frisked me. Um, and that was 1986. I was skinny then. I was 40 pounds ago. There's no way that that policeman was, could have been afraid of me. And that was the point I was making. I can't prepare you, I can't protect you from predatory policing, but um, we have to persevere. Now, giving and caring, that empathy point I was on, giving and caring is a family value of ours. Your great-great-grandparents on the other side, Grandma Harriet's parents modeled that. This is John Francis Clark and Hattie Clark. They raised five children in West Virginia Four of them became doctors, and the fifth became a lawyer. Two of them are here in this audience. John Francis Clark, educated at the University of Chicago and Harvard, was a school principal, leading educator in West Virginia. Hattie was a brilliant girl, became a teacher at 15, bought her first piece of property at 17. Striving people. Their house during the Depression was filled to bursting with people who had lost everything. Again, this is the legacy. We were following that legacy of lifting up your family, which you must always do. They'll lift you up when you stumble. We were follow following that legacy when we took in your cousin uh, to put her through college. But beyond family, you need allies. And I want you to try to find your allies, whatever color they may be. Some people you won't be able to connect with. Try to understand their perspective, um, but if you can't connect with them, move on. When you were about 18 months old, I was with your father, we took you to a restaurant, and a maitre d' leaned down and looked at both of you and said, which one of you is going to be a rapper and which one of you is going to be a ball player? And I said over his head, how about a doctor or a lawyer? And he looked up, looked me in the eye and said, aiming kind of high, aren't we? With a tinge of resentment. And I left the, you know, I had my, our meal there. We had a meal, and I left the restaurant seething. But, but as I thought about it for a minute from his perspective, I thought, well, you know, maybe that man is really struggling to raise his kids on what he makes in that restaurant. And his kids may have the privilege of not worrying about being profiled by the police, but your family you have two parents with six degrees between you, and there, and his children don't have the same opportunities as you, and there are a lot of other children who don't have the same opportunities to, as you do. And we have to begin to heal this country, set it on a new course of fairness. And if we continue to have the situation now of sequestered advantages for people who are already advantaged, opportunity hoarding, I call it, um, I think we'll have given up on the idea of America, and I'm not ready to do that. So I take 
I, I, I take heart in the fact that your generation will be the first, will be better. The first generation in American history where no one group is dominant. You will be better. But you won't realize your potential if you don't consciously try to build multiracial coalitions for the common good. Now, I won't burden you with leadership, but I will expect you to join a multiracial coalition for fairness that attacks the separate and unequal system that we have today. So, put on your armor. Prove others wrong in their assumptions about you. Find your multiracial army and fight together for the country you deserve. Thank you.